A seed is actually a small plant encased in a hard shell. And all the DNA for that little seed to grow into a full tree and full blossom is actually contained in the seed. Nothing new is ever added. I think Genesis 1 to 3 is a bit like that, that the whole story of the Bible can be condensed into one sentence. God's kingdom in a new creation, under his son and bride, awaiting a Sabbath rest. Welcome to the Blessed Podcast. I'm Nancy Guthrie, author of the newly released book, Blessed, Experiencing the Promise of the Book of Revelation. The Book of Revelation begins and ends with a promise that those who hear and keep what is written in it will be blessed. And I don't know about you, but I want that blessing, don't you? So that means we need to hear what is in this book, what it has to say to us so we can live in light of it. On this podcast, I'm having conversations with people who can help us to hear it, to understand its message to us, and to help us reckon with what it will mean for us to live in light of that message. And my guest today is Johnny Gibson, or I should probably call you Reverend Dr. Jonathan Gibson, PhD, shouldn't I? Uh, Johnny's fine. (laughs) Johnny is Associate Professor of Old Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary, and I'm delighted to be here at Westminster today talking to him. Now, you may be familiar with Jonathan. He has a lot of book credits to his name. One of one of his biggest books, and by big, I mean like could use as a doorstop, but um, you wouldn't want to waste it on that because of the wisdom in it, a book called From Heaven He Came and Sought Her, Definite Atonement in Historical, Biblical, Theological, and Pastoral Perspective. A couple of years ago, he wrote another really big book called Reformation Worship, where he went back and uh, he presents a lot of liturgies for worship uh, from from the past. He's also written a number of children's books lately. He wrote a beautiful little book called The Moon is Always Round. And then he's got this new series he's doing with uh, Timothy Brister called The Acrostic of God. But I'm really excited about this brand new book he has. And I, and I told him when I saw him that when I saw this book was coming, I looked at it and I thought, that is a book I have been looking for. And it's called Be Thou My Vision, A Liturgy for Daily Worship. Johnny, tell us a little bit about that book, will you? Sure. Um, So during COVID 2020, when we're all in lockdown, I uh, was thinking a bit more about my daily devotions and becoming a bit dissatisfied with them. I had this sort of rather bland liturgy, if you like, of uh, saying a quick prayer, read my Bible, and then giving some petitions to God, and uh, I thought I need to enrich this a bit more. So I started thinking about how I could use prayers from church history and order a a daily liturgy that was a bit richer than just prayer and Bible reading. So I've put together a 31-day daily liturgy where each day is the same fixed order of liturgy, Uh, and it basically goes call to worship, an Old or New Testament text calling us to worship, then a prayer of adoration, then a reading of the law, seven different readings of the law, and then a confession of sin, assurance of pardon, a creed, a catechism question, a prayer for illumination. Then you read a chapter of the Bible or whatever your reading plan is, and then a prayer of intercession followed by your own prayers, and then you end with the Lord's Prayer. And all the prayers, the adoration, confession, illumination, and intercession are all prayers culled from church history. So it's being led in prayer with Augustine and Anselm and Luther and Calvin and Spurgeon. Okay, Johnny, I grew up in a tradition that would say, you know, to use something like somebody else's written prayers or creeds, that kind of stuff. I mean, I was kind of led to believe nobody who said those really meant them, you Mm -hmm. know, that there was something cold and wrote about that. So. Mm What would you say to my former self and attitude about that? Yeah. Well, you know, the Lord of the church gave us a rote prayer with the Lord's Prayer and one that I think he expected us to say together as a church each Lord's Day. So rote prayers in themselves are not wrong. It's all about the heart, isn't it, really? And I was brought up in a tradition that was very much against rote prayers or written prayers. 
and it was all about extemporaneous prayers. But yeah. I could have told you what the person was going to pray before they prayed it. <laughs> so there was, there was a liturgy a, to it, right? Yeah, it was a learnt prayer and learnt patterns of prayer, and they were quite repetitive, actually. And I find for myself, reading and praying other prayers that have been written, actually I find myself more engaged sometimes than uh, if I'm just trying to pray on my own. Now, it's not that I want people not to be praying using their own words, and I have a section in the liturgy where they do their own personal prayers for personal church and world matters. So I definitely want people to be praying their own heart to God on various matters that are a burden to them. But at the same time, I think it's helpful to be led in prayer by others. And the fact that Paul tells us what his prayers are in his epistles, I think, in and of itself shows us that he expected prayers to be read and thought upon and meditated upon. And uh, and then you have, if, if you read church history, you have this great tradition of people writing down their prayers, Augustine and Luther and Calvin. You know, Calvin would uh, say a prayer at the end of each of his sermons, and in his commentaries, those prayers are written there, and he knew they would be written down. So even the great likes of Calvin and all weren't against written mm. prayers being read out. Yeah. All right, you made a believer of me. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's d- dive into talking about Revelation, except we're actually not going to start in Revelation. I'd actually like to start in Genesis. Mm-hmm. You've done a lot of teaching on Genesis 1 through 3. And I suppose there's a sense in which we can't understand what's happening in Revelation, or we certainly can't feel the joy and relief and anticipation mm-hmm. of what transpires in Revelation unless we understand how things began in Genesis, where what God had in mind, where that was headed, mm-hmm. and then therefore the catastrophe of what happened mm. in the fall. So talk to us a little bit about Genesis 1 through 3. When, you, when you're teaching this, what is it you're trying to get across to people in terms of what's happening there? Well, the illustration I use, and I get this from Gerhardus Voss, is that the first couple of chapters of Genesis are like a seed uh, that develops throughout the rest of Scripture into a tree in full blossom. And so all the DNA of uh, a seed, a seed is actually a small plant encased in a hard shell, and all the DNA for that little seed to grow into a full tree and full blossom is actually contained in the seed. Nothing new is ever added. I think Genesis 1 to 3 is a bit like that, that all the DNA of biblical revelation is contained in that seed of those first three chapters. So the rest of the Bible is really just watching that organically grow and develop and come to full blossom in the New Testament and ultimately in Revelation as a book and especially the last chapters. How does the Bible begin? What is the seed of God's revelation? I I use a one-sentence summary that has been informed from others that I've learned from, and I say that the whole story of the Bible can be condensed into one sentence, God's kingdom in a new creation under his son and bride, awaiting a Sabbath rest. Say it again so people really can think through every little part of that phrase. So God's kingdom in a new creation under his son and bride awaiting a Sabbath rest. So perhaps I can unpack that. Yes. So God's kingdom, uh, you know, broadly speaking, God's kingdom rules over all the world. That's his rule, his uh, reign. Uh, That's across the whole world. And yet in the Bible, God's kingdom is also narrowly focused on a holy people in a holy place. And that holy people in the beginning is Adam and Eve, uh, a couple set apart. And uh, Adam is presented to us made in the image of God. So he's like God, his father. So he is a son of God. And we know that from Luke chapter 3, actually in the genealogy of Jesus, it goes all the way back to Adam, the son of God. So Adam is a son of God. Um, In technical terms, in class, I I call him a protological, typological son. Protology just meaning first things, the study of first things. Typology meaning type and anti-type. So Adam is the first type of a son of God. You get other types. You get Israel as a son of God, national typological son. You get David, Solomon, royal typological sons of God. 
But the Bible begins with Adam as a son of God. And then we see in the second part of chapter 2 of Genesis that God gives him a bride. He makes a woman from his side and brings him to Adam. And uh, they're married. And so what we have at the very beginning is God the king ruling over the world, but also ruling over this special place called Eden, set apart. It's a holy place. And he puts this couple in the garden, puts Adam in, and then he makes the woman from Adam. And they are a holy couple in holy matrimony. And so it's God's kingdom in a new creation under his son and bride. That is, Adam is to administer the kingdom on earth, awaiting a Sabbath rest. Now that's connected to their creation on day six. Adam's created day six. Eve is made on day six and they marry on day six. And then day seven is the Sabbath. And so the Bible begins with God's holy couple in a holy place under his holy law of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, administered by Adam, God's holy son and representative. And they are waiting for the Sabbath to come. Now, the Sabbath itself was a type of that eschatological rest, the rest that we read about in Revelation. Uh, And Adam, through his obedience to the covenant of works in relation to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was to bring humanity into that final rest that Revelation speaks about. Now, we know because of the fall, he never brought mankind into that rest. So I think what you're saying is that, so Adam, uh, had he obeyed, Mm -hmm regarding that forbidden tree Mm -hmm. that he as that first son would have been able to bring all of his progeny all the who are Mm -hmm. come from him into the sabbath rest that god intended yes the way i put it is adam was asked to fast from one tree so he could feast at another Mm -hmm. tree he was to fast from the tree of the knowledge good and evil and having obeyed the test passed the probation he would have been given access to that tree of life, which was a symbol and sacrament of eschatological life, eternal life. And he would have brought his wife with him and all their posterity into that state of confirmed righteousness, eternal life that was unchangeable, could a not. greater glory. Yes. That greater yes. Greater satisfaction. Yeah. So Adam was made in the state of innocence. And he was not yet, he was perfect, but not yet fully matured into the state of glorification. So he was to move from innocence to glory, but we know that he fell into sin. And then God makes another covenant about another son who's to come, who will take us from sin into the state of grace and on into the state of glory. I suppose we could say that's what most of the Bible is from then on, isn't it? From Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter three, until we get to these last three chapters, God working out his plan. Mm. It's not a new plan mm-hmm. because it's really what you you stated as his original plan. Yes, he's just basically trying to restore it and consummate it. So uh, when God makes the promise in Genesis 3.15 of a seed of the woman, it's interesting, it's a son she, he's promising. And so it's the promise of a son. And in a sense, the rest of the Old Testament, to borrow a phrase from Sinclair Ferguson, The rest of the Old Testament is a footnote to Genesis 3.15. And so you have this anticipation of a son coming who's going to crush the serpent. And yes, so the rest of the whole Bible is about uh, waiting to see God restore what he created in Eden, but not just restore it. It goes back to that point of from innocence to glory. He's going to restore it and then consummate it. So the way I put it to my students is that The trajectory of the Bible is not an arc on a horizontal line from creation to new creation. It's an arc on an elevated line from creation to new creation. So we move from a garden to a garden city. Herman Baving puts it really well. He says, uh, paradise was not heaven. Adam was not Christ. So Adam is a man of the dust, made of the dust. Christ is a man of heaven. He's a life-giving spirit, 1 Corinthians 15. So through Christ, we get advanced into a different realm, a different level of quality of life than what Adam was created into. He was supposed to take us to that realm. He didn't. And so God sent the second and last Adam to take us into that realm. And the, the picture of marriage actually plays all the way through that it's a son and a bride. Mm-hmm. You see it with Isaac. You know, he's the promised son. And he needs a bride yes. in order to keep the keep the promise and the 
uh, to bring the nation into existence. And, and but then as we move through the rest of the Old Testament, it seems to be that the the nation of Israel as a whole becomes both that imagery of son and bride. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about when Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh and mm-hmm. they say, let my people go, for, because Israel is my firstborn son. Mm-hmm. And of course, this son is going to prove to be just as de- disobedient as the first son, mm-hmm. Adam. But then also throughout the Old Testament, the Lord speaks of, of the nation of Israel as his bride. Mm-hmm. I think about in Isaiah, he says, your maker is your husband. Mm -hmm. And yet this marriage in the Old Testament is a really bad marriage. Mm. Yeah, you've got two images there in the Old Testament. You've got father and son. God is the father, Israel is the son. And you also have God as the husband and Israel as the bride. And so it's it's not so much mixing the metaphors as just respecting them in each book that deals with it. So Exodus is very much father-son. But the prophets then pick up on the relationship in the image of husband-wife. And so Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Malachi, they all refer to the relationship as a husband and wife. I think about Jeremiah 2.2, where when when I read it, I just picture God as a husband, that he is, he's looking at the wedding pictures Mm -hmm. from the wedding, uh, longingly remembering. Here's what he says. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. And so so he's remembering back when their marriage was new, when this nation came out of Egypt and they're in the wilderness. But at this point... That marriage has gone so bad because mm-hmm. Israel's always running off to the high places, having liaisons mm-hmm. with other gods, which God, as a jealous God, mm-hmm. he's offended by because mm-hmm. he intends there this to be a love relationship. Yeah, exactly. God's the faithful husband and, and Israel's the adulterous wife who's always being lured away by the nations to worship their gods and in a sense marries their gods. And uh, that's the sort of imagery through which we are to understand Israel's unfaithfulness in the Old Testament. And then it gets to the point with Hosea. Yes, what? Tell us, talk to us about Hosea. Well, it, it gets so bad that God, in a sense, says, right, it's time for a divorce. It's time for the marriage to end because you've been so unfaithful. And Hosea is given the, the task of enacting it in his own life, having to live out what it's been like for God in relationship with Israel. And so I think the marriage metaphor is very powerful, isn't it? Because at the heart of marriage is faithfulness. It's about a covenant faithfulness. And God has never broken his side of the bargain or the commitment. But Israel keeps breaking her side. And uh, I think that's a really helpful way to understand. That's really the ministry of the prophets, isn't it? Calling Israel back to marital faithfulness to her God. I think it's a beautiful thing, too, that in the Old Testament, God as a faithful husband, has given his people a whole book of love poetry Mm. that seems as if it's intended to say, you know what, Israel, my wife, Mm -hmm. this is the kind of relationship I want to have with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want it to be intimate and joyful for us Mm -hmm. to love each other. This, This whole book of song of songs or song of Solomon a beautiful picture of, of the love relationship he wants to have with his people. Mm-hmm. It's uh, I love the line, I am my beloved's and my beloved's is mine. And I think that really captures the heart Doesn't it? of the book of the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon. And it's really a picture, isn't it, that uh, human marriage is a picture of God's marriage with his people, just as human marriage is a picture of Christ and his bride, which we'll come to, I'm sure. But In the Old Testament, human marriage is a picture of God's relationship with his people, Israel. And the Song of Songs just speaks about that in very intimate terms. And that infuses our human marriages with a lot of meaning and purpose. Mm, I think we can tend to think that God was maybe just kind of looking around his created world. Let me see if I can find something that might say something about the relationship that I want to have with my people. Oh, there's marriage. I'll use that. Mm. And that kind of gets it in the opposite order, doesn't it? Yeah. Instead, no, I've, I've created marriage mm. for the very purpose that it would speak to the kind of relationship I want to have with my people. Exactly. And it goes back to Genesis where 
those early seeds of God's revelation. It's all typological. It's all in preparation for a greater marriage to come. And Paul picks this up in Ephesians 5, 29 to 31, where he says that the marriage that took place in Eden and all subsequent human marriages since are actually pointing us to the great mystery of Christ and his church. And so exactly, sometimes we get it the other way around. We think that God's relationship with Israel is an illustration of our marriages, but it's the other way around, which really does change your marriage, doesn't it? It really impacts how your marriage, faithfulness in marriage and love and devotion to each other. To want to be a beautiful reflection of God's faithfulness mm. toward his bride. Yeah. It serves as a, a proper motivator. Mm to our own marital yeah. faithfulness. Yeah. It shows why marriage matters and shows why uh, the break in a marriage mm. vows, why that would mm-hmm. break the heart of God. Because mm-hmm. yeah. it's so against who he is, his mm-hmm. very nature and character. Mm. Well, let's let's move into the New Testament. Yeah, I think the Gospel of John, we're talking about Revelation on this podcast series, and you've got the Gospel of John, which I think this whole picture of Christ as bridegroom and the church as bride, it's not only in Revelation. I think it's also here Mm. in his gospel. I think it's also in his epistles when you think about Mm. God is love. Mm -hmm. There it is. But um, I I love it in in the gospel of John. He's the one who begins his gospel. We've got chapter one, but then you immediately go to chapter two, and the first thing he tells us about is this wedding Mm -hmm. in Cana. Mm Mm-hmm. And, but there's a crisis at the wedding. Mm-hmm. We've run out of wine. And, and if you read the story and you get who gets the credit for actually supplying the wine at the end of the story, then you realize whose responsibility it was to provide the wine at the beginning, which was it was the bridegroom's responsibility. Mm-hmm. But there's, but, so the crisis really at, in this story is an unfaithful bridegroom, a failed mm-hmm. bridegroom. He's failed. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. in his task of supplying this wine. Mm -hmm. But it's not a problem because the true and faithful bridegroom Mm. is on the scene. Mm. And it seems as if John is immediately wanting us to begin to see Jesus as this true and faithful bridegroom. Yeah, it's a beautiful story. It's his first miracle. Um, And I think the fact it's his first miracle introduces us to one of the metaphors and images that we're to view Christ through, and that is the bridegroom. Here is a bridegroom from heaven. He has come to seek for himself a bride. Yes, from, it tells us something about his, his purpose for coming into the world, yeah, right? Yeah, and I think it helps structure the whole Bible. Back yes. to Genesis, you have a bridegroom and his bride at the beginning, middle of the Bible, the New Testament, first miracle, bridegroom mm-hmm. and his bride. End of the Bible, you have a bridegroom mm-hmm. and his bride. And so marriage is like central to the whole story of the Bible. John goes on in chapter 3, in the middle of chapter 3, John the Baptist is having an interaction in which he says, I am not the Christ, I've been sent before him, I'm verse 28 of chapter 2 and then 29, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, and I can like see him pointing to himself like, I'm just the best man, people, right? Mm-hmm. Who stands and hear him, hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. And so here he is. He, he's pointing to Jesus as the bridegroom. And then you move from there into chapter four of John, and you've got this picture once again of, a, of failed bridegrooms. Here's this woman who comes to the well, which, by the way, throughout the Old Testament, God has often presented a bride at the well. I think we could say even at Eden, you've got this picture of this garden mm-hmm. paradise, right? Yeah. This water flowing through it. Yeah. Isaac. You Isaac, know, he brings the bride, bride at the well. Yeah. Uh, Jacob mm-hmm. meets his bride at the well. Mm-hmm. Moses goes, and there out, out comes mm-hmm. Zipporah, one of mm-hmm. the daughters of the priest of Midian, right? Mm-hmm. And so here's a picture of Jesus, and he goes through Samaria, and he goes to a well, Mm-hmm. And out comes the most unlikely prospect mm-hmm. for him to join himself to in marriage. And yet isn't this what he's wanting the world to see about what he's looking for in a bride? Mm. In that, you know, she comes out there, she comes from the wrong family, and she's got this shameful sexual history, mm-hmm. and she's 
She's been married five times, five failed bridegrooms there. Mm-hmm. She's living with someone who she's not married to, another failed bridegroom. Mm-hmm. And here's bridegroom number seven. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. and there he is. He's offering himself to her. Mm-hmm. And I think he's also showing his disciples and showing us now as we read this, who he's looking for to be a part of his bride. And it's not going to be simply limited mm. to the children of Israel, to the Jewish people. He wants Mm -hmm. a bride that is made up of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Mm -hmm. And I think the hope that I see in this too is that the bride is not going to supply her own purity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, (laughs) That's going to be a result Mm. of becoming joined to this bridegroom. Mm. And, you know, here's the bridegroom she's sort of been looking for all her life. She's been searching for someone. And now here he is standing before her and offering her water and life and eternal life. Uh, But also it's the connection with wedding and worship, uh, marriage and worship. I think here you have the joining of the two metaphors of husband, wife, but also son as well. A faithful son leading his bride in true worship. So you got Adam is the son of God, and he allows his wife to be led astray into false worship through the serpent. And then you have Israel, a son of God, who is, in a sense, to marry the nations by bringing them to come and worship the true God. Instead, through intermarriage, they're led into false worship, idolatrous worship. And then you've Solomon, who marries Pharaoh's daughter, and in a sense, he should convert her and bring her to true worship of Yahweh on Mount Zion. Instead, she and his other That's wives lead, lead him into idolatry and he makes worship centers for them east of Jerusalem. East of Jerusalem, it's interesting, like east of Eden. Mm-hmm. And so what we're waiting for by the end of the Old Testament is a son of God who will lead his bride in true worship of the one true and living God and not be led astray into idolatrous worship. And so I think that's what we have here. We have the combination of the son image and the faithful husband image where Christ is the son who is marrying a bride and he's leading her in true worship. And he begins with a Samaritan woman, an unclean woman. He begins with her and leads her in true worship of God. So I think that's where you get the two images of son and marriage, uh, husband coming together here in John 4. That's beautiful, Johnny. I've never seen that before. Thank you for that. As as we look at this theme, working our way to get to Revelation, I do think you've already mentioned it a little bit. You have to stop in Ephesians Mm -hmm. 5, don't you? Mm -hmm. Uh, You were... You were talking about some later verses about this mystery where he he goes back to Genesis. But before that, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And then this, this purpose statement that really corresponds to your purpose statement you gave us from Genesis chapter Mm -hmm. one, I think that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. It's a beautiful picture of why Christ came down from heaven. You know, from heaven, he came and sought her to be his glorious bride with his own bloody border and for her life he died. And so Christ has come to win a bride for himself and to present her on that last day to himself. I think what this helps us with as well is it helps us with the now, not yet aspect Mm -hmm. of this marriage relationship Mm -hmm. between Christ and his church. So Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, says that he betrothed the church to Christ as a pure virgin. So we are not yet married to Christ. We're betrothed to Christ and we're waiting that marriage supper of the Lamb. And so here in Ephesians 5, it's it's giving us that intentionality. He came down, he died, he sacrificed, and he's he's in a sense presented us with a dress and said, here's a clean dress to put on. Now, you know, come and marry me on this last day. And uh, I think that Uh, Ephesians 5 helps us with that sort of now, not yet tension as well that there is in relation to our our relationship as the church to Christ, our husband, to be. Purification process Mm -hmm. is, it's in process in Mm -hmm. terms of the spirit is at work 
in mm-hmm. us, even now sanctifying mm-hmm. us, mm-hmm. Uh, making us holy. That's the direction we're headed in. Mm-hmm. But we are awaiting that to come to its full consummation. Yes. We're engaged, but it's been a long engagement. Yes. And we're, as you <laughs> so say, far. as you say, it's the now, not yet. We're, 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 we're betrothed. We're being sanctified. We, we are united to Christ now. And yet we are waiting for that final consummation mm-hmm. where we'll all come to fruition. When I think mm-hmm. about the book of Revelation and this mm-hmm. imagery, before we, we hear about the bride, it seems to me that we're, I'm looking in chapters like 17, 18, and 19, we get the picture of kind of the anti-bride or this one who's out to seduce us mm. so that we don't enter, mm-hmm. so that we don't become purified, mm-hmm. so that we don't finally mm-hmm. enter into mm-hmm. this marriage with the bridegroom. Mm-hmm. And it's it's the picture of this great prostitute who is so seductive and it seems to me that it's really a picture of uh, trying to seduce us away Mm -hmm. so that we don't actually end up in this Mm. divine holy marriage forever Mm -hmm. i think you see it uh in psalm 45 don't mind me going back there actually for a moment yes but uh in psalm 45 you know you got this beautiful progression of the bridegroom the beauty of his words the beauty of his war he is a single man who's won victory, seated on his throne, waiting for his wedding. And then it shifts to the daughter, the bride, and it says, Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. It's, it sort of interrupts the procession of this wedding song. It's like the bride's having second thoughts. It's like she's having doubts. Should I go? Because I actually to go and marry this groom will involve me leaving my father's house and my people. And I think it's a really nice picture of conversion to Christ, that actually when you get betrothed to Christ, you are leaving the world and the flesh and the devil. You are forsaking your father, the devil, and his people, and saying, I am going to change my allegiance here. And so you've got that in Psalm 46. So the world's always luring us away from our betrothed husband. And you have it in... uh, 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul speaks about betrothing the church to Christ as a pure virgin. Then he says in verse 3, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Talking about false teachers coming into the church and trying to lure people away, um, away from a pure devotion to Christ. And I think that fits it, doesn't mm-hmm. it? With Revelation, you, you have Babylon and the beast, and their sole purpose and intent is to basically lure the bride away. And um, uh, yeah, and then you get this this call <laughs> in Revelation eighteen: "Come out of her, my mm-hmm. people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins mm-hmm. are heaped as high as the heavens." And so, I hear in what you're saying that that coming calling away from the world. Mm-hmm. Calling away from the seduction. We see it in our own wedding vows, don't we? Forsaking all others, mm. do I give myself unto you as long as we both shall live. And that that's it's actually a beautiful statement. It's it's an exclusive commitment. And uh, I think that can be captured in these uh, parts of Revelation come out from her. Mm. Forsaking all mm-hmm. others. Mm-hmm. Give yourself to Christ alone as your husband. Uh, in, in chapter 19 of Revelation... We read the, about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Finally, the wedding has happened. You know, you and I, mm-hmm. right now, all of us, we are betrothed to him. It's this mm-hmm. long engagement, and we're longing for this day, for this mm-hmm. marriage supper. And it, it tells us in Revelation 19, uh, 7, Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. I think this is so interesting, the wording here, mm. because we think about we're the bride of Christ, and he is the one who is purifying us, and yet we kind of see both sides here, don't we? Mm-hmm. It, it was granted to her, mm. sounds like the work of God, mm-hmm. to clothe herself he, he gives us the dress, and we willingly put it on. You know, there's that by faith. It's his righteousness, but we receive it by faith. And then uh, when we get to Revelation 21, it seems like this is 
what this story of marriage has always been headed toward. It's this final resolution when we read in 21, 2, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then that's somewhat reiterated uh, a few verses later. Here's this voice saying, come, I will show you the bride the wife of the lamb, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city. It's so interesting to me here in in Revelation 21, both times he's combining this imagery of a city Mm. with a bride, Mm. which I think reveals to us he's talking about a people. Mm -hmm. All right, I want you to just close us, Jonathan, by kind of going back to your statement you started out with in Mm. Genesis chapter 1. How do you relate that to what we read here in Revelation 21 and 22? Well, I think what we have here is the consummation of what Genesis 1 and 2 pointed towards. So I said that the whole Bible could be summarized in Genesis 1 and 2 as God's kingdom in a new creation under his son and bride awaiting a Sabbath rest. And I think what we have in Revelation 21 and 22 is um, God's kingdom in a new creation under his son, capital S. Mm -hmm and bride enjoying a Mm. Sabbath rest. So we have reached the consummation in Revelation 21 and 22. And if I may just throw in a hymn, because I know you love to sing as I do, um, you know the hymn, The Sands of Time Are Sinking? It's not one I grew up singing, but I am familiar with the words written by, what's her name? Anne Anne? Anne Rose Cousins. She she put a hymn, she wrote a hymn based on Samuel Rutherford's letters. Yes, yes. And it is an absolutely beautiful hymn. It connects we'll sing with, it. Well, I'm tone deaf. I'm I'm a jailhouse singer. <laughs> say it. I, I'm behind a few bars <laughs> looking for a key. Um, but uh, every verse is connected to this central theme of marriage. Oh, is it? And uh, but the the last verse is the bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. Uh, I will not look at glory but on the king of grace, not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hands. The lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. Mm. And, you know, we will rejoice in the dress that we're given, Christ's righteousness, as chapter 19 says, but really we will be fixated and in awe of his face. And I, I think that hymn by Anne Rose Cousins, The Times of Sand Are Sinking, really captures the beauty of this marriage between Christ and his church as seen in the book of Revelation. And here it is at the end of the Bible, and yet it's really a new beginning. Mm. Reminds me of C.S. Lewis, you know, how he ends the last battle. This was only the beginning of another story. And uh, I think you're right. It's it is the end of the Bible, but it's the beginning of the, our marriage to Christ in a new heavens and a new earth. A marriage in which death will not do us part. Mm -hmm. The happiest marriage of all time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The marriage we were always intended for Mm -hmm. with the most beautiful groom, Mm. most loving, most faithful groom. Mm -hmm. And we as the bride will have been made pure and Mm -hmm. holy. Mm -hmm. And I think then the the song of songs will become even more true for us. Uh, He is the fairest of 10,000. That song, in a sense, also points us to the consummation of all things, that we will be in love with our bridegroom. I am my beloved's. And my beloved's is mine. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for shining some light on this story of God's intention. Uh, Let's see, I want to be able to say your line and remember it in terms of what God is doing in the world. The history of the world is God's kingdom in a new creation under his son and his bride awaiting a Sabbath rest. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you. This has been the Blessed Podcast, a Crossway podcast hosted by Nancy Guthrie, the author of Blessed, experiencing the promise of the book of Revelation. I hope you'll join me for the next episode of the Blessed Podcast. Thank you.